Thank you very much to the organizers for this nice workshop and for having me. And uh, I will talk about uh, large-scale spiking neural network models of um, macaque and uh, human cortices. And um, we used uh, uh, the full density of neurons and synapses in each um, area that we model. And uh, one reason for doing this is uh, that when you consider uh, reduced models, uh, then that uh, distorts the correlation structure between uh, the neurons. Um, also, by uh, um, resolving individual neurons, but going all the way to the brain scale, we uh, we capture multi-scale activity, <coughs> and um, um, we uh, integrate. Uh, data from, uh, from a multitude of sources and um, hope to, uh, to contribute to consolidating this uh, sort of zoo of existing models. Um, and before uh, going into the two models, uh, the multi-area models, um, I will um, briefly introduce their microcircuit building blocks. Um, all the uh, local areas uh, are variations of this uh, circuit by Pochans and Diesmann, which describes uh, one square millimeter of uh, cortical surface. This is a model of early sensory cortex. Um, it uh, consists of um, about 80,000 leaky integrated and fire neurons connected mm -hmm. by uh, um, 300 million synapses. Uh, each of the cortical layers, two, three, four, five, and six, contains one excitatory and one inhibitory population of such neurons. And uh, the connectivity is layer and cell type specific, but otherwise random. Um, all the neurons uh, receive a stochastic external drive, representing the non-modeled parts of the brain. And uh, this model simply reproduces a synchronous irregular state. Here the spikes of the excitatory neurons are shown in blue and of the inhibitory neurons in red. And um, you see the uh, different spike rates across layers and, uh, and populations, uh, for instance, with the lowest rates in layer 2, 3 and the highest in layer 5. Um, but uh, not everything is included in this microcircuit. For instance, it doesn't show the slow activity fluctuations that are observed in uh, resting state activity here, recordings from V1 in macaque, uh, where you see yeah, slow and, and fast um, time scale um, fluctuations in the, in the population activity. And also being a model of only a single um, area, it uh, the microcircuit cannot capture interactions between areas as seen in um, resting state fMRI, uh, functional connectivity, or, um, or propagation between areas as uh, um, measured here uh, in an EEG study. Um, so we set out to try to reproduce these things uh, in a multi-area model, and we chose uh, the macaque uh, visual system as a model uh, system because of the availability of uh, rich anatomical and physiological data for it. Um, it's also a stepping stone towards uh, modeling the human brain. And in reality, uh, one hemisphere of, um, of macaque vision-related cortex uh, contains on the order of 800 million neurons, but that's still uh, too much to simulate routinely even using the supercomputers. Um, so we, uh, we start by uh, representing each of the 32 areas in the Fellman and Van Essen parcellation by one of these uh, square millimeter microcircuit models. And that leads to a total of about 4 million neurons uh, connected via um, 24 billion synapses. So that's still plenty. And we simulate it using Nest on the Ulich supercomputers. So these 32 areas, they are the visual areas and areas that are strongly connected to visual areas. Um, these areas, they are uh, connected in an approximate hierarchy, as was first shown by Fellman and Van Essen. And this hierarchy is based on um, pairwise laminar connection patterns between areas. So uh, for instance, going up the hierarchy, um, the connections mostly emanate from the upper layers and terminate in layer four. 
and going down the hierarchy, they mostly emanate outside, um, well, uh, so more in uh, infragranular layers actually and terminate outside layer four and then between areas at the same level of the hierarchy, um, the connections originate uh, almost equally uh, supra and infragranularly and they terminate in a more or less columnar fashion uh, across all layers. But uh, due to deviations from these characteristic patterns, there is no um, uh, unique uh, hierarchy that you can define actually. And um, so uh, one way to resolve this indeterminacy is to uh, use so-called architectural types or neuron densities to define the hierarchy. So you use a property of individual areas rather than these pairwise patterns. And these architectural types, they describe um, the neuron densities and the distinctiveness of the lamination of the areas. For instance, uh, V1, primary visual cortex, is a U-laminate area. It has a high neuron density, it has a thick layer four and distinct lamination. And as you go up the hierarchy, then uh, neuron density decreases and the thickness of layer four decreases and ultimately it dis disappears altogether in so-called agranular areas. But at the same time, the volume density of synapses is uh, relatively constant, and that leads to areas uh, higher in the hierarchy um, to uh, receive more synapses per neuron. That also matches the more integrative role of, of uh, higher cortical regions. And we can use these um, architectural types to, to estimate the neuron densities that we need to determine our population sizes uh, where they are not measured uh, directly. Um, next, we need the connectivity between the areas and that we base on uh, axonal tracing data that are uh, collected, for instance, in the COCOMAC database and also in a quantitative data set from the lab of Henry Kennedy. And these data from uh, the COCOMAC database are mostly uh, qualitative. They tell you which areas connected to which um, but these uh, fractions of labeled neurons from retrograde tracing experiments, they, um, so they actually counted how many source neurons are uh, projecting to the given, uh, the, inje uh, the injected target area. Um, then um, these data are quite extensive, but they're still incomplete, so we need statistical regularities to, to estimate the missing values. For instance, the, um, an approximately exponential decay of connection density with distance. And then um, we arrive at a, um, an area-specific connectivity matrix um, where it's uh, most important that um, the connection densities uh, uh, span about five or six orders of magnitude. And next, we also uh, need to determine the laminar patterns. And for that, we can again use this uh, quantitative tracing data, um, so-called uh, fractions of supragranular labeled neurons, or SLN. Um, they um, tell you what fraction of the sending neurons are located in layers two and three. And this is related to the hierarchy and also to, and thereby uh, to the ratio of neuron densities. So when you go up the hierarchy, then you go to an area with a lower neuron density and, um, and the, the connections emanate mostly supragranularly and, um, and yeah, the other way for, um, for feedback. And uh, so again, we use st uh, statistical fit to estimate the missing data. And uh, in turn, these laminar source patterns are also related to laminar target patterns, as we saw before on the, on the slide um, about the visual hierarchy. And then we know on the target side, uh, statistically, where the synapses are located, but we still uh, need to map them to the target uh, neurons, which might have a cell body in a, in a different layer. Uh, so that we do via um, um, morphological reconstructions of neurons and then assuming proportionality of the, of the connectivity to the uh, lengths of the dendrites in the different layers. 
And then putting everything together, we finally arrive at a population-specific uh, connectivity matrix for all these 32 areas. And we turn on the simulation. And in the beginning, we get a sort of boring state. Uh, and it turns out that we need to um, increase the strengths of the synapses uh, between the areas uh, compared to within. Um, to, to obtain these slow fluctuations. We need to increase the synaptic strengths more onto the inhibitory neurons than onto the excitatory ones to uh, not uh, get excessive activity. And at some point, um, we have the, uh, the same uh, mix of uh, short and long fluctuations that was seen in the uh, experimental data. If you increase the uh, cortical cortical synaptic strengths even further, then you spend an increasing amount of time in this high activity state. Uh, so we need to, uh, uh, we need the network to be poised um, just below this uh, instability, just below a transition to a high activity state. And um, in this uh, uh, state that we can also call metastable, the activity looks like this for three out of the 32 areas, just uh, as an example. Uh, this is uh, primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and the frontal eye field. And you see this uh, yeah, uh, population fluctuations at different time scales. We also have still uh, low rate uh, activity, um, low correlations, and an ir irregularity that is similar to, to that of a Poisson process, so that's quite realistic. And then the population activity fluctuation fluctuates on different time scales. Um, we, we wanted to quantify the uh, agreement uh, of the spiking activity with the experimental data, so we looked at this resting state activity from V1. And uh, yeah, we see that now we are able to reproduce um, um, the increase in, um, in low frequency activity in the, in the spectrum. Um, and also the uh, distribution of uh, single neuron spike rates uh, uh, matches experimental data really well um, when uh, the network is poised uh, just below the instability. Uh, finally, we also looked at the functional connectivity between the areas. So here we just compared um, the correlations between the synaptic inputs to different areas with the fMRI uh, functional connectivity average over six monkeys. And, and this uh, correspondence between these two matrices um, peaks at uh, almost the same uh, cortical cortical weight factor where the microscopic uh, spiking activity was the most realistic. So when we're in this metastable state, just below the instability, um, both the microscopic spiking activity and the macroscopic functional correlations are best reproduced. And uh, this agreement is also as well, as good as one uh, might expect based on the variability between the individual monkeys. And we made the entire source code uh, publicly available for others to build on. And um, next we wanted to um, explore human cortex. Um, here we are considering an entire hemisphere, not just selected areas but uh, in a coarse parcellation, so the total number of areas and the total number of neurons is still similar to that for the macaque model. But uh, uh, one important difference is that the um, neurons receive more synapses per neuron, about twice as many. And so we have more uh, synapses in this model. Um, the neuron densities and laminar thicknesses are taken from a very classic uh, publication, von Economoi and Koskinas. And we again uh, investigate multi-scale resting state activity. Um, here, uh, we cannot use invasive uh, data to uh, define the, uh, the uh, inter-area connectivity, of course. So we use DTI, uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Um, that's at the area level. Uh, the, um, the local microcircuits are, again, sort of scaled versions of this potjans diesmann um, model that take into account the different density of uh, synapses in human cortex. And um, we again take into account that uh, neurons may receive synapses in different layers than where they have their cell bodies. So we use 
here um, human neuron morphologies uh, from, this, uh, from this publication and again assume this proportionality of the connectivity to uh, the length of the dendrites in the different layers. <coughs> Uh, also, uh, laminar connection patterns are not available for human cortex, so we have to um, base this on a statistical uh, estimate here that we um, have for macaque. So these uh, fractions of supergranular labeled neurons, as, um, we, we use the macaque fit to, to estimate these laminar source patterns and again assume that, these, um, that the laminar target patterns uh, can be inferred from the laminar source patterns, and um, and that's how we then ha have the layer-specific connectivity matrix. Um, the fraction of white matter connections in the human brain is probably uh, lower uh, compared to the macaque brain because uh, of our bigger <laughs> brain. Uh, there would not be enough space for all the myelinated axons if it were the same. So uh, we use this uh, scaling um, derived in, in this paper uh, by um, Herculano Hosel and others to estimate uh, that the uh, fraction of uh, gray matter connectivity is 86% in, uh, in human cortex compared to 79 in, in macaque. <coughs> This is uh, maybe, uh, so the human brain is, is often described as particularly highly connected between areas, right? And that's just uh, <laughs> a bit uh, misleading. So it's more like this. And um, so finally, we, we, um, <laughs> we have the population-specific connectivity matrix. And again, we turn on the simulation, and we do the same as before. We scale the cortical cortical uh, synaptic strengths. Those are anyway not well known from experiments. And um, yeah, in these preliminary simulations, um, we find again that we have to be just below this uh, instability, so in this sort of metastable state, to reproduce uh, also um, spiking activity. There are a few uh, single neuron uh, recordings uh, available uh, from human medial frontal cortex so they, uh, obtained during surgeries. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have resting state fMRI from 19 subjects, uh, one of them being one of the PhD students working on this, uh, on this project. And um, uh, yeah, so, but this is still uh, quite uh, preliminary. Um, we are uh, looking at, uh, we're still trying to reproduce these findings for more realistic uh, single neuron parameters that we then uh, take from the Allen Institute, from the Allen cell types database. <clears throat> okay, so um, I showed that uh, with our large scale um, spiking neural network models, we, we are able to reproduce aspects of microscopic and macroscopic resting state uh, <coughs> dynamics. Um, and uh, the network needs to be poised just below an instability to, uh, to reproduce these. And um, the exercise of constructing these models uh, reveals uh, gaps in the data and, and statistical regularities that help us gain insight into cortical organization. And we hope that this uh, type of modeling uh, will help to consolidate the model zoo and, uh, and also form a basis for functional models. And uh, for the work that I presented here, I want to thank in particular um, Maximilian Schmidt for the macaque model and Alexander van Megen and Yari Pronoid for, for the human model. And I uh, thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions.